It's on board, Sharon. Leave it on. <laughs> I just pressed on record, so this. This uh, presentation is being recorded, so just so that everyone knows, in case uh, you want to send this uh, recording to anyone, I can, cool. you know, send it to Rob and Debbie and whoever else wants it. You can keep it. Um, I was saying, and I was saying, this might be the impetus I need to start a YouTube channel. The first yeah. video. Uh, I need something to upload, you know, and maybe I can just run my mouth for a week. Well, I have to do a little 30-second commercial because I'm also a part of something called Aramis Communications, and that is a gentleman by the name of Tony McGinley that lives in West Grove, Pennsylvania. He is a Catholic man who has a an online radio program. So um, I recently uh, I'm going to be starting something called the St. Raymond Onatus Foundation radio show and oh, wow. for guests. So I'm putting that out there because that's something that we're looking to do and to develop. So awesome. look, look for that in the future is the St. Raymond Onatus Foundation with Oremus Communications. That's O-R-E-M-U-S Communications. Hi, Carl. Hello, Carl. Welcome. Carl, if you want to speak, you're welcome to, and you just have to un unmute your microphone. And... Um, this will be given the talk to people might not be talking, but when we have the interactive time, um, you know, the option. There you go. I think you're unmuted now. And now you're muted again. Hello, Carl. There you go. Hey, Carl. Hi, everybody. And hello, Gary Mike, too. Great. Yep. Hi, Mike. Hi, Gary Mike. Good to see you. This is cool. It's like a house party. It's awesome. So let's wait. Let's see. Here we have 802. Uh, let's wait at least, you know, five more minutes for the rest of you sure. know people to log on and remember that we're having this uh, presentation. Gary and Mike, the house where we're in Ann, um, and Angela's house, they have three cats here. So we we had a cat right oh, yeah. over our shoulder. We were trying to get him in, yeah. but we see your cat too. So it's cool. <laughs> cat the cat might come in the background. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> No, I can't. Like my so, party. Yeah. yeah. This is an yeah. introvert's dream. You don't have to uh, leave your, your kitchen. You have coffee yeah, right with awesome. you. That's awesome. You can retreat at any it's time. Kind of party. Yeah, it's Debbie's kind of party. I'm a little bit more extroverted than Debbie, but not by much. Yeah. <laughs> I love a good party, though. <laughs> Okay. Well, let's see. We'll wait. We'll wait till 8:05, and I think at 8:05 sure. we'll do our opening prayer. Sure. And, um, People can jump in at any time. I think when we even when we get started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just a reminder that this uh, this cast will be from eight to nine, and as much as we would like to continue it past nine, we will conclude with the prayer to Saint Raymond Onatus at the end, and then we can. Get in touch with all of you about the next one because we definitely want to uh, pick this up again. Perfect. So we have somebody else that just joined us. Hi, okay. Kate. Kate, are you calling in on the phone? Kate is here. Hello. Is that what that means? Yeah, I think okay. so. Well, hi, Kate. I don't know if um, okay. if uh, some people were muted earlier, and if you if you if you're on a phone, I don't know how that, that works. But welcome. Glad welcome. you're here. Good to, good to see you. Or good to hear yeah, you. you have to you have to touch the screen to get the options. Okay. On a phone, at least on my iPhone, I had to touch the screen and then I saw the options to unmute. Okay. Yeah, okay. You might just have to touch the screen. Hey, how are you? Hello, Sarah. Sarah. Hi, welcome. Hi, Sarah. This is awesome. This is pretty cool. <laughs> We're gonna get started in a couple minutes. You're welcome. Yeah, I think we'll wait till eight oh. I said eight oh five. Okay. And then we can get started. Sure. And just a, an announcement too. If you want to, you can you can meet at any time. If it's um, if it's easier for you, and then when we have a time to interact later throughout the show, you can unmute. Yeah. It's easier if you mute 
um, until you have a, a question to ask or something, because we can hear kind of everything. So I hate to kind of say that, but I'm just, I'm picking up on a lot of like, um, uh, boys. so yeah. So if you wouldn't mind muting, um, and can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, okay good. Great. Who is that? Chrissy. Hi, oh, Chrissy. Chrissy. Hi, Chrissy. Hello, Thanks Chrissy. Great. And do you want to get started? Yes, let's get started. We will definitely get okay. started. Okay, okay, so I want to welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. My name is Ann DeSantis, and I am the director for the St. Raymond Nonatus Foundation for Freedom, Family, and Faith. And I have my husband here, Angelo DeSantis. Hello. My husband, uh, we just had our, celebrated our 29th wedding anniversary. So <laughs> thank you. Well, back in August, but yeah, thank you. So the St. Raymond Donatus Foundation, before we get started, just to tell you a little bit about that, is we are associated with a religious order. It's called uh, the Mercedarian Religious Order. If anybody's familiar with that, um, we are headquartered in the Philadelphia area in the Overbrook section of Philadelphia. The Mercedarians have uh, four vows to their charisms, and it, the first one is poverty, chastity, obedience, and the fourth one is the willingness to give their lives for those who are in danger of losing their faith. So that really is the heart of what this foundation is all about. Um, and as I said, we are the St. Raymond Nonatus Foundation for Freedom family and faith. So that's why we're here. Um, this presentation is from Rob and Debbie Marco. And I'm going to give a special welcome and a special introduction for them before we start our prayer. So let me just tell you who we are interviewing this evening. And there are new friends. Okay, Rob Marco, and this is his own um, little bio is a 38 years old father of three, grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, became a Catholic at 18 after a powerful conversion experience. He appeared on EWTN's The Journey Home and writes about faith, family, marriage, chastity, and Catholic manhood on his blog. His blog is called Wisdom and Folly, Rob the Fob, dot blogspot.com that's rob so welcome rob Thank and you, we have debbie debbie his wife was born and raised in wilmington delaware her parents are from the philippines and um from came to the united states in the 1960s and she is the youngest of four she's a cradle catholic and attended catholic school from k through 12 and it wasn't until her early 30s when she experienced a reversion and discovered a rich and deeply personal relationship with Jesus. Debbie has been a nurse for 20 years and works uh, part-time in the ER. She's also very passionate about her home and family and just started her first year of homeschooling for their six-year-old son, David, and five-year-old daughter, Monica. So welcome, Debbie. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Anything else you want to add before I say our prayer? No, I think that covers yeah. it. <laughs> yes, we are so happy. Uh, the St. Raymond Onatus Foundation is so happy to host Rob and Debbie Marco. And um, we would like to stay in touch with all the people who are on this uh, webcast. So please email me, take your pencil, your pen down, and stay in touch with Ann DeSantis at director dot s r n f at gmail.com that's my email address at st raymond nonatus foundation so thank you so much i'm going to give you my number too for anybody who wants to contact me at any time we are a foundation that supports the strength of marriages and families and my phone number is 215-870-9919 one three okay <clears throat> the prayer and this is the prayer uh for christian families let's come into the presence of the holy spirit in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen lord father almighty 
the family is the most ancient institution of humanity, for it is as old as man himself. But because it is thine own institution and the only means by which man comes into the world and develop to the greatest perfection, therefore the forces of evil are assaulting it, causing men to despise this basic unit of Christian civilization. In suicidal fury, they seek to deal it a mortal blow. Let them not succeed, succeed, Lord, in their destructive designs on the Christian family. Through the intercession of the glorious St. Raymond Anatus, pleader in heaven for the happiness, welfare, and peace of Christian families, we beg thee to hear our prayers. By the merit of this great saint, our patron, grant that our homes may ever be modeled after the holy family of Nazareth. Let not the enemies of Christian family life triumph in their sacrilegious attacks, but rather convert them to the truth for the glory of thy holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you. And Rob and Debbie will do the ending prayer for us this evening. And just for those who've just come in too, I think it'd probably be best um, uh, for everyone to mute until um, we have time for um, things at the end. So we can kind of pick up on interference. So if you can mute your voice until you have a question and then unmute, um, that would be great because then, um, because it's, uh, you know, we can hear things too. So for those yeah. of you just came in, those of you just I came agree. in, welcome. So just mute, mute your, the audio. And then when you're ready to say something, then you unmute it so that we don't hear that kind of like that buzzing noise or whatever, or the all kinds of interference. Okay. So um, we're going to start out. Um, I did the introduction. We are so thankful for Rob and Debbie joining us. And as I said, just a little side note that uh, Rob was actually interviewed on television with uh, Marcus Grodi on the Journey Homes EWTN's program. So when he did that program, part of it was devoted to just telling us about uh, his life. And, and we also want to hear about Debbie's life growing up. What was that like? So my question for both of you would be um, just to describe your your you know, you're, you're growing up, your young adult life, and was there a specific moment in which you felt a growing conversion? Sure. Do you want, want me to go first? Yeah. Want to go first? Yeah. Well, um, some of the people who've seen the, the Journey Home episode, this might be old news, but I'm happy to um, talk about it again, because I had most of my um, conversion before the age of 18, so it was... Uh, when I was raised, um, I had a great, you know, upbringing. My family um, was very, uh, my parents were very loving. I had two brothers. We had a great home life and everything. We grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, but um, my parents were different religions. They were, one was Catholic and one was, my mom, my dad was Catholic and my mom was Episcopalian. And, um, you know, at the time we were, we didn't really have much religious instructions. So a, part, a lot of my high school years was, kind of searching for, um, you know, those big questions about what, why am I here and, and who is God and who is, you know, this Jesus that I hear about. And um, I really didn't have any kind of baggage, I guess, or any, any hangups from like any preconceived notions about, I was kind of an open slate for um, the, the work of God in my life and not having any really religious background to kind of, uh, be prejudiced against. So um, really it was, uh, you know, some powerful experiences of recognizing my, my sinful state, knowing that I needed a savior, but not really knowing who that was and coming to Christ. Um, and then in college, when I did meet some other Catholics and kind of started to explore the, the faith, um, realizing that it, it really is a kind of a watertight, um, you know, traditional, uh, the passing down of the faith through the apostles, all the things that kind of I could trust my experience with um, was really there in the Catholic faith. So um, I had a really good experience at Penn State um, with the Catholic community there welcoming me. And that's kind of the five minute background into my conversion. I, went, I didn't want to take too much time with it, but, um, you know, how about you, Debbie? Yeah, mine, my story is a little different. I um, 
I, I'm a cradle Catholic, so I grew up, um, I went to Catholic school, kindergarten through senior in high school. Um, my parents are Filipino, so they, um, culturally, the Filipinos are very devout Catholics. So I grew up, everything about my upbringing was around the Catholic faith. Um, and so, you know, believing in God and believing in Jesus was never an issue for me. But it wasn't until much later um, when I turned, when I was in my 30s, um, I just, I experienced some, uh, you know, challenging situation, very, um, just a hard, a difficult time. And it was through that circumstances that um, I started to experience a reversion in my faith. Um, and just to back up a little bit, when I went to college, unfortunately, like most college age children or kids, um, I started to stray away from the Catholic church. I, I rarely went to church on my own. I grew up going to church every Sunday with my family, but when it came to me embracing the faith as my own, um, I strayed a little bit. So all through my 20s, um, even though I believed in Jesus and, and God and um, considered myself Catholic, I just started to stray. But it was in my early 30s that I just had sort of like, it's like a lightning bolt. I just experienced a sudden uh, reversion into my faith um, and just discovered uh, just a very rich personal relationship with Jesus that kind of and it catapulted me into kind of like what Rob mentioned, recognizing my sinful state, recognizing I wasn't putting, I wasn't leading a Christ-centered life. And um, the part of that too was that your, you know, Debbie's Christian friends who had been praying for her for a long right. time. So um, I actually, yeah, I have one of my dear friends that I grew up with um, since I've known since I was five years old. Her family, um, they're Catholic and they're Christians, were praying for me for years and um, and praying for sort of like this um, conversion of my faith and. Um, so they, when I experienced this reversion and experienced um, kind of a rebirth in my faith, they were kind of there to help me along, which is so important mm -hmm. to have a, a community. They kind of adopted. Yeah. Debbie, I think. Yeah. That just helped me along this faith journey because I started asking questions like, I know Jesus died for our sins, but what does that really mean? Even though I know this growing up my whole life, what does that truly mean? What does that mean for me? And I started asking some of these really important questions um, well in in my early 30s and um, and I was single at the time, so I'm a little bit of a late bloomer, but thank goodness it happened before I um, even got close to marriage because, um, you know, when having that relationship with Jesus was so much more important to have before any other kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's, that's my little five minute, mm -hmm. you know, summary of my, of my faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much both for sharing that. It's it's very powerful. It, and I know that there's a lot more to your story, even though what you're saying. So um, I'm going to move on. I do have a list of about 10 questions that we'll try to get through. And mm -hmm. if anybody has a, a question at any time, why don't we have you sort of like raise your hand a little bit so that we know to stop. Um, so we'll go on to um, the next question that I have. So the next one I have is um, just kind of centering on that young adult life. I said, how would you describe your young adult life? And was there a specific moment in which you felt a growing conversion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, I had a real kind of uh, Augustinian uh, childhood. Um, I was attracted to the to 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 the life of grace and of God working in my life through like a negative way in the sense of like, I kept, um, I kept kind of doing things that I thought would make me happy and give me contentment and everything I was kind of looking for to just, to just, you know, the way you kind of chase things. Um, that was my whole kind of, uh, upbringing. So, you know, in high school, you know, I really got into Buddhism for a while before I found Christ because the whole idea was that you, you, um, you know, all life is suffering in, in terms of this a dissatisfaction with, you know, the, the ephemeral nature of things that don't last. And then we're disappointed and then we're in this kind of cycle of craving. So I really kind of identified with that because it was, um, I was constantly being disappointed. I felt like like my friends were were there for me, but they couldn't always be there for me. My family was there for me, but they 
wouldn't always be there for me because they, you know, would, would pass away. And so I was really looking for the eternal and um, something that wouldn't disappoint and wouldn't would last. And um, so I didn't have a totally wayward life, but I, I definitely didn't have any foundation. Um, I had like a general moral foundation, but I didn't have any of the specifics of like um, a Christian worldview. So my adulthood was really spent striving to find something that I was looking for that I didn't know what it was. And so that was kind of, the, if you read the life of St. Augustine, that is really um, a big part of his life is looking for that, that thing to fill that God-shaped hole. So when I did discover the Catholic faith and I did have this encounter with Christ in a, in, on this backpacking trip, um, it really made me realize that the grace was working in a way that was there was a permanent um, satisfaction that can come to, to one's life, a peace and a joy that no one can take away. And, you know, when I would read scripture later in life and re Jesus talked about the living, living water at the well that that never uh, you never go thirsty again. That's kind of was my experience. Mm -hmm. um, for me, mine was um, in my I would say my young adult, like I mentioned before, I, I strayed a little bit in college. Um, but what really brought me back was um, being in, I was in a relationship that ended and I think I was idolizing that relationship and idolizing um, marriage over God. Mm -hmm. That was ultimately um, what has, ha what happened. And when I came to that realization that God was not the center of my life, um, I had a complete uh, reversion of my faith and just, um, complete change of heart. Um, and I really, and I clung to the scripture of basically trusting in the Lord with all my heart and leaning out on my own understanding and acknowledging in all my ways and he'll leave my path straight. I clung to that scripture because everything that I was hoping for was taken away. Um, but I was trusting in the Lord that, you know, I'm just going to trust in him and he's going to provide in his right timing. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of my journey was a, a test in trust. Mm -hmm. And um, during that time, it was just, um, it was just life changing. It was, he changed my heart. And, um, and from that moment forward, I just really um, kept growing in my relationship. So um, that's, you know, once, as long as Jesus is in the center, that's when everything else kind of falls into place. When mm -hmm. that's not in the center, uh, you find that, you know, you're going upstream a lot. And mm -hmm. that's, that's what I discovered in my, in my young adulthood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yes. Really answer this questions, you know, give us some insight about what it was like for you and, and just the journey there. So another question I have was what advice would you give to young adults or newly married Catholics or those of other denominations? What, what advice would you, Well, a big thing for us that I learned from my parents that I'm really grateful for is, um, you know, they've been, they just celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary. So I had a model of, uh, of devotion and commitment in my parents, which I'm very grateful for. And Debbie had that as well. But the one thing I, I do recall from my parents that gave me a lot of um, confidence as a child was that divorce was never an option. So it was taken off the table very early on. I don't know if my parents ever said that explicitly out loud, but it was always implicit that whatever happens, um, you're just going to have to work it out. The, the divorce is not an option. So for us, I think establishing that kind of from the start in the sense that like we're in this we have, I have a sacramental marriage and I know that's not always the case for everyone, but in our case, we, we were married in the Catholic church. We, you know, we have met all the conditions for a sacramental marriage. And in that sense, in the eyes of God, you're married to death to us part. Debbie jokes that it's, you know, I'm with her till eternity, but I keep reminding her that it's only till death. And that after that I'm free, but, but she says, you know, you're with me forever. And I said, not forever, just till death. But, uh, all joking aside, the um, the option taking divorce off the table from the start. Uh, thankfully, we were both on the same page about that. That kind of 
removes a temptation, I think. Um, if you have this kind of one foot in and one foot out or, or always in the back of your mind that I can get out of this, when that's not there, it kind of, and your back is against the wall. Um, the story I like, you know, to, to relate is like, um, when it comes to vows, marriage vows is the story of Odysseus, um, in the, in Greek mythology where he has, he's on a ship. Um, and then he hears the siren song of this, the sirens who will lead the, the ship astray and they'll, they'll crash on the shore. And he has, um, all his, uh, the other sailors on deck tie him to the mast. So he, he hears the siren song, but he can't, um, can't kind of escape from the mast. And that's the only thing that saves him in the end. So I kind of relate marriage vows, you know, in in our situation, but marriage in general to that, the rope that kind of, not, not, it's not like a, you know, I don't mean it in a negative way, but the things, when things get really hard and you start to have that temptation to, to step out of it, you need somebody to tie you to the mast and remembering those vows and having friends that remind you like, Hey buddy, you, you, you made these for better or worse. You can't get out of this. Don't even think about it. Those kind of friends are invaluable in the, that kind of situation when things do get hard. And they do they do get hard at, at times. Um, We've actually started, um, it doesn't happen often, but when we fight, which we do, like all couples do, um, it's counterintuitive. Uh, and Rob is the one that does it mostly, is he grabs my hand. It's not very tried. often, but we've, we've done but it in before. It's very arguments, tough. Um, um, you expect so, them to push you away or to yeah. turn around and leave the room or something, but instead he grabs my hand and he holds it really tight, doesn't let go. And, um, you know, how do I get mad at that when uh, <laughs> he's grabbing <laughs> my hand? But it's um, it helps diffuse things a little bit, but it's that reminder that, you know, that we're committed to each other. You know, and you're kind of a, acting against your nature yeah, sometimes it, in those, those times where it's, yeah. it's hard to love and it's hard to, you know, you're mad. Um, another thing I wanted to mention too, just one more thing is that for us, you know, we, uh, we might get to this a little later, but we, we were praying for each other before we met. So we had a very, a really grace there and God kind of um, working in our lives to kind of bring us together, I think. But I do think that there's a danger sometimes in having the kind of soulmate mentality that like there's the one person that I'm meant to marry and things like that. And, I can't say in my experience, but my, my kind of thought on that is that, you know, when you make a commitment to marriage, um, you know, you can kind of look around and kind of, you know, whether you test throughout this, whether this is right or not, you know, in dating and engagement, but once you make those vows in a sacramental marriage, you know, you really have to abandon that idea, which I think that that temptation comes up sometimes that the person I married is the wrong person or this isn't my soulmate and this, this other person is. So the idea that I think it's a little bit more, I mean, in my, my kind of feeling is it's a little bit more pragmatic. Marriage is a little bit more pragmatic. If I was talking to like a 20 year old or 25 year old thinking about marriage or, or maybe in their first couple of years about marriage, marriage is a lot more pragmatic than people uh, think early on because the, um, you learn really quickly. I think most people have been married for a while learn that, you know, liking the person that you're married, that might not always be a, a, a given for us. You know, I'm grateful. I do like my wife, um, which is very <laughs> important. It's almost as important as loving them because you have to live with them for the rest of your life. So, <laughs> uh, you, no, and, and you, no, not, not eternity. Just so um, but the, the idea that like somebody else, you marry the wrong person is a real temptation. I think when things get hard, that's a, people um, it can be difficult sometimes. So the idea that when you made a commitment that you're committed to that person is a testament to God's, you know, um, wedding himself to us as you know, adopting us as sons and daughters of him and doesn't leave us uh, even when we turn our backs on him. So that I think is a, a good model to have for um, people who are kind of, maybe thinking about marriage or maybe in their early years. I don't know. Thank you. I just want to interrupt for a second because I think is Chrissy, are you there? Uh, Chrissy, I think might have a question. If sure. Chrissy can hear me, I don't know if she can hear me. Yeah. Hi, Chrissy. Chrissy I'm, I'm, I'm having a little difficulty with the screen. I'm not familiar with this. That's okay. We can hear your voice. So. That's okay. 
<laughs> no, but I didn't have a question. <laughs> sure. No, I don't. <laughs> oh, you don't? Okay, great. Okay, okay. cool. Well, if, if, if anybody does at any point, just kind of chime in and we'll... Yeah, on my screen, it said um, that Chrissy was, um, you know, had some questions. So, okay. okay, glad that we at least can clear that one up. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, how about, um, if you don't mind, we'll move on to the next question. Sure. Next question I had, and I know that we have discussed this before, that uh, Rob and Debbie are, uh, had been practicing natural family planning. And I, my question was, what impact has being open to life and uh, natural family planning had on your marriage? Sure. So this was a big part of our conversion, to be honest with you, because it wasn't always the case that we practiced natural family planning. When we were early, when we married, I was, I was, um, what was I, 31 mm -hmm. when we got married? Yeah. Yeah, and, um, oh, 30, yeah. And Debbie was uh, 35. 35. So when we got married um, almost 10 years ago, we, we, you know, we were, we had plans to have children. Um, I, you know, just to back up a little bit, I, I, my conversion to the faith at age 18, I always thought I would be a, a, a religious. I, I discerned religious life for about 10 years to join a monastery. And so uh, intellectually, I always had, I was like 95% in, but the 5% that I wasn't assenting to in my mind and kind of my, my hangups were always um, around the church's teaching on birth control. And that wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't really relevant in my life because I wasn't married. I thought I would be celibate my entire life and everything. But when we got married, that became a, a thing because I, um, I didn't know, I didn't have too many experiences of people who weren't contracepting, um, even, whether Catholic or otherwise. And so it was really a point of grace that our hearts were changed on this subject. So we had our, our, first, our son pretty early on. He was- Yeah, we had him, um, I think a year after we got married. Yeah, and then, so- um, So we, and we both spoke about it. We thought, oh, you know, with my age, one, two kids, you know, mm -hmm. we thought that would be good. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was that, and we had Monica, um, so they're, they're 17 months together, apart. So yeah. they were pretty close together. And then after Monica is when I think we really started Talking about NFP. Yeah, you know, people and, who have two kids, you know, two is like the, um, it, it can be, it sounds, for people who have eight or nine kids, they think, oh, two kids is a piece of cake. But for people who are kind of just starting out and have two kids that are close in age, kind of back to back, pretty close, you know, it can be a very challenging time for people, um, I think. And um, that's when, for us, it was like, well, we got to put the brakes on and, um, we started meeting with a, a Crichton instructor for mm -hmm. to learn NFP, but we weren't fully c committed to it. I don't think we were charting and things like that, but we still had a fear. I mean, I'm speaking for myself. There was a fear of children. Um, like it was kind of like we wanted children. We wanted children on our own terms. We wanted, you know, I wanted like two. Anything beyond that was kind of, I don't know if I can handle this. There was a lot of, um, I was, it was a lot of white knuckling and a lot of fear mm -hmm. of like, we just can't have any more kids. This is just, it's very um, uh, fear motivated. But we, but we also, using this method in Crichton, it's um, compared to using contraception, mm -hmm. um, it was an ongoing conversation mm -hmm. the, between the two of us. It wasn't like, okay, you go on the pill or you do this right. and, you know, end of discussion. It right. was It was a constant discussion. And it wasn't just that, it was also like a, a test with our trust in, mm -hmm. in God. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we think, think about recurring themes in our, our faith walk, it's always about trust. Mm -hmm. um, so not only was it the conversation between the two of us, but it's all, it includes God in the equation. Mm -hmm. um, but regardless, we were still very fearful and um, we, we used Crichton or, or NFP after our second child. Um, and I'll be honest, I, you know, being in my late thirties at that time, I really, I, in my heart, I, I wanted more children. And there were times when I would kind of nudge Rob and try and, you know, you, you try and get him on board. But he was between the two of us, he was more like white knuckled about it. 
you know, no more. He wasn't open to any more. Um, but at the same time, he wasn't, I think you were, you, I was, you didn't want to go to contraception either. I was wrestling um, with it. Um, yeah, he was definitely wrestling because with it. Because it was, uh, it was very, it was theological, it was a theological issue, but it was very, very prag practical and pragmatic and nuts and bolts because, you know, when you're married and you're engaging in relations, you know, if you put the brakes on that or you engage in it, it, it has implications. So um, it was not, I couldn't just theorize about it because, you know, it was our life and, uh, you know, children. But a big part of that behind it was the, this sense of control. Like I wanted to control the situation. I wanted to kind of control everything. And there is a degree to that in NFP that you exercise your reason. And um, but there's also a recognition that we're not fully in control, even when we think we are. So mm -hmm. we had a, a real kind of opening of our heart, breaking open of our hearts after. How, how many years was this after Monica? Um, four years. Yeah. So we, we there's a big gap between our, our, our third and there's a story that's really a miraculous story behind the birth of our third child. Do you want to you share anything about it? About um, I'm not sure if this will come into play later. So I guess, yeah, it ties in with our, um, you know, with NFP in a sense. I don't know how much you can do well, well, because this kind of goes in with, um, we'll start with, I'll, I'll try and, try and um, keep it brief, but uh, I lost, it, this, this is related to the miraculous metal. So we experienced, both of us, experience simultaneously a lot of graces um, when we discovered the miraculous metal. Mm -hmm. which, we, which we both wear now and we both started wearing mm -hmm. it around the same time yeah. and it was very um, it was um, serendipitous that we found. Right, so my um, I found this metal um, it was on Labor Day weekend and it was in it was sitting in the pew at a church at the church we we're going to on Sunday Mass and I saw it and I said to Rob I said um, somebody left their metal and uh, Rob said to me, "No, that was left there for you." And he said that kind of like in um. I didn't know like the words were out of my way. mouth before yeah. I even knew what I was saying. But I said, "You know, you take that. That's, that's for you. Right. You wear it." So I didn't think too much of it, and I just kind of, you know, put it in my purse. And um, and two days later, my mother actually collapsed, and um, the next day we found out she that she wasn't going to make it, and she died um, the next day. So um, during that whole experience of losing my mother, I had that miraculous medal in my purse the entire time and I held on to it. And um, the night before she died, um, I started praying the rosary. And my mom was someone that prayed her rosary almost every night. Uh, she always had her rosary within arm's reach. And um, I always knew that about her. And um, that night before she died, that was the first rosary that I actually prayed with her. Um, but in having that miraculous medal, we were, you know, doing some research on St. Catherine and how the miraculous medal came to be. And it turned out St. Catherine um, lost her mother when she was, I think, just eight years old. But, um, but knowing that she wasn't an orphan, that we all have the Blessed Mother, um, you know, that knowing that in St. Catherine's life and knowing that, that that medal came into my life at the same time I lost my mother was a lot of, it just provided a lot of comfort to me. And, um, you know, being a cradle Catholic, you know, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I never truly embraced or understood, you know, like the devotion to Mary and saying the rosary. I knew it my whole life, you know, prayed the rosary, my, you know, before. And it wasn't until, you know, losing my mother, I truly realized and I'm still, you know, discovering the beauty of praying the rosary daily. Um, you know, what that means, what the Blessed Mother means to me. Um, but we've been wearing this medal ever since. And shortly after my mother passed, this um, was two years ago. This is two years yeah. ago, and we were actually still practicing Crichton. Mm -hmm. um, we we got pregnant, which in itself was a miracle. We thought, you know, it was impossible, <laughs> and um, and so we were going through, you know, a it lot wasn't, of emotions. It wasn't expected. Though. It wasn't expected we at all. It wasn't planned it, at yeah. all. Um, and but unfortunately, we miscarried at twelve weeks. So there was, and this was probably within about two months of losing my mom. So I was going through a lot of um, grieving and uh, mixed emotions. And Rob was going on his, he was on his own journey too, um, going through his own you know, kind of faith walk of wrestling with, you know, 
being open to life and being excited for another child, but then losing losing the child. And I was already 40 at this time, I think, mm -hmm. 41. Mm -hmm. And um, so this really opened, this is where I think we sort of shifted not only the con the understanding of NFP, but just the openness to life. Like, what does that mean to truly be open to life? And sort of repenting for our sin of, you know, we really weren't open to life mm -hmm. for a good part of our marriage. Mm -hmm. um, we tried to control that aspect of our marriage and mm -hmm. our, of our family life. And um, it's sort of, you know, um, you know, God gives us this child and takes it away. Mm -hmm. We're really wrestling mm -hmm. with why did this happen? Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of things are sort of happening simultaneously and just growing and understanding this openness to life. And I had, you know, one thing that um, talk about talking about advice to young couples or young married couples is adoration, especially during these difficult times. I really went to adoration so much shortly after my mother dying and going through the loss, the miscarriage. Um, and um, it was in through the through these times, you know, God was always telling me he's here. He's helping me. I'm here to help you, um, just like he always is in these circumstances. And um, and he was working on us. And even though you're when you're deep in these um, struggles, you may not realize it, but he is crafting something for your future. And you just you just have to trust again. There, that theme of trust comes up. Um, so we, you know, this was an ongoing conversation and, you know, after the miscarriage talking about what do we do now? Do we continue NFP? Do we, um, it was a little confusing, but I know for Rob, he was, his heart was softened, um, from going from really never wanting to have any more children to him also being devastated that we had this loss. Um, I knew something was happening in him also. And, um, so as we're still having this conversation, we actually experienced another loss. Um, again, it was an unplanned pregnancy and that ended in the miscarriage, um, which was early on, but it was still, um, you know, still, uh, you know, devastating because we're still not recovered from these other losses. Um, but again, I think God was just working on us. I think um, praying our rosary daily and just, you know, spending a lot of time in prayer in adoration, I think he was just working on us. And at the time we didn't see it, but in mm -hmm. hindsight, mm -hmm. we just see how he was working on our hearts. Yeah. And God, I know was telling me, you know, I thought my devastation was partly, you know, I'm in my forties and you know, that window's closed. It's, you know, I, I just had it in my head, which I think is part of our culture too, is like, oh, when you're past a certain age, it's just that door's mm -hmm. closed. Like, don't even bother or don't, why would you even consider it? Or even just the, what Debbie mentioned about the culture, like, the contraceptive culture is so it's like the air you breathe and the water you drink like mm -hmm. in the culture so even the idea that children are a burden rather than a blessing right. or we we had to have a total paradigm shift and that's what's so cool about nfp um as a method of spacing children but also as a different way of thinking about every everything really i mean control mm -hmm. trust god children blessings and what's cool is when you you know in your marital life when you are when you are um practicing this um there is an openness that it's kind of a humility that recognizes you're not totally in control so there's you know it's it might sound a little risque but but there is an excitement almost that you can you can have a child at any moment even when you're you know doing your best to maybe avoid I don't know, from a, you know, a relational point of view that kind of keeps things fresh. It's like the Holy Spirit really is, is always there because there's always room for God to work when, you know, when you're contracepting, it's, it's, there is a kind of physical barrier, but there's also a, a spiritual barrier in some ways too. So I don't want to go too much onto this because I know you have other questions, Anne, but that's kind of our experience has been NFP has been a really a blessing for us to know that the church teaches us not as a burden to lay on people, but as a way of embracing a trust in God that opens the door to other graces as well. And to end that, the, the completion of this, when we were with that kind of heart, we were open to life. And, uh, and shortly after, we did become pregnant with our third. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a healthy 
eight month old, yeah. eight months old now, <laughs> Christopher. Yeah, so. Um, but that whole experience with um, when you trust, it is sort of, you know, it's 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 just a complete total surrender of we trust you, Lord. We'll take whatever you give us because mm-hmm. we know you, it's for if, our good. We right. know you know what's best for us even better than we right. have an idea. So and, that's what. And even experience losses, Lord. If this pregnancy is another loss, we, I praise you in advance mm-hmm. for that, and just use us to glorify whatever you have in store for us. It was really a complete and total surrender. Mm-hmm. If it's special needs, if it's you know, if there's any kind of difficulty pre- with the pregnancy, there's once you're pregnant, there's a total loss of control, mm-hmm. but having that stance of it's all for the Lord and he knows what he's doing. It's very liberating. And Mm -hmm. there wasn't really, well, there's so much, there's so much anxiety that can come into when you don't have the Lord in your life or you don't trust in Providence or that, that, that God is a loving father that provides for you. You can get consumed by the anxiety of the what if. So what if we have a children's Mm -hmm. special needs or what if we, what if Debbie has health complications and she dies, you know, all the possibilities we just we've handed it over to the lord and i remember having this after monica was born it was just too much for me to control everything so i just said lord just take it so that's been a real comfort for us and that's like the assurance of faith that god wants what's best for us and wants to provide Mm -hmm. us with that thank you that was awesome and you know what i definitely think we should schedule you know we can talk about doing like kind of a part two part three part four where we can go into a little bit more detail about that issue especially because i think that's a really Mm -hmm. important issue for marriage and family um Mm -hmm. i think it's been now we got like about 10 minutes and maybe five minutes before we end we'll of course do our prayer and i want to see if anybody out there has any prayer intentions but i thought maybe you could tell us um you know one of the questions was just to kind of tell us about your kids uh, your family life, uh, the journey into homeschooling, uh, maybe a little bit about hobbies, fun things that you do as a Catholic family. So that would be great to hear at the end. Mm-hmm. Sure. So um, after we got pregnant with our third, we decided we made some drastic changes with our home life. We used, I used to work full time. I was in an administrative job for nursing, and then um, after our third, it was we just did a complete turnaround, and I'm part time and we decided to homeschool. But that- you got to back up a little bit with oh. that because we, like, we had, well, first of all, the the homeschooling was never on my radar before. Yeah. Um, this that was, was a, always- That was a three-year decision-making process. Yeah, so we were living um, in Delaware and we, you know, moved three years ago for, you know, so the kids could go to public school and we moved to a good school district and we had all these kind of, intentions of sending the, the kids to public school because that's what I did and that's just what we were going to do and um, I'd say everything that Debbie kind of prayed for with trust and turning over like you know I want more children but Rob doesn't so Lord you know can you change his heart I want a homeschool <laughs> you know but Rob isn't yeah. on board with this and I know he has to be on board with it so can you change his heart and yeah. so I don't know where the kind of change came but David uh, went through a year of kindergarten in the schools and it was fine. But, um, you know, I, uh, you know, when Debbie and I met, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't have a job. I didn't have a car. She really trusted in my uh, ability to, you know, I guess she prayed for resourcefulness. She didn't yeah. pray for a rich husband. I didn't pray for a, a rich husband, yeah. but I got a resourceful husband. <laughs> <laughs> so we've made a lot of changes in terms of, um, you know, with Debbie working full time, that we don't have any like um, you know judgments or, or opinions on like you know everybody has to do kind of what they need to do. But for us, um, Debbie working full time and me working full time and the kids in daycare and stuff, it it was what we were doing because it was what we thought that's just what you do. And we never thought that you know we could. So part of the the title of this talk was God God being able to make a way when you trust him. And really, this is a big part of it because I, I, you know, God has provided in terms of like providing for our needs. And um, I don't have like some six figure job. And Debbie, you know, has always um, had a good job. But for me, working has always been an important part of my sense of self. I've always worked. I've always worked since I was 12 years old. And Debbie kind of reluctantly worked because it's Mm -hmm. um, it was she enjoyed 
being at the hospital and stuff. But I think in her heart of hearts, she really wanted to be home and she yeah. really wanted to homeschool. And we didn't know how it would work financially and, and otherwise, because we, we kind of made this move and it was all based on, you know, how we imagine things on our plan. Um, but I don't even know how to explain it, to be honest with you. I mean, there's something, there, it's working and by God's yeah. grace, um, the he's given us what we need when we need it in terms of making these intentional choices, but also providing the graces to go with that um, so that Debbie can stay home um, and, and work a shift here and there. But right. primarily, it's, I mean, it's just improved when you think about the rhythm of your family, mm -hmm. you know, when we were both full time working and kids in daycare it was not a good, it was a very stressful household. My heart wasn't there. Rob knew it. Um, and that so brought it was, stress it, in to it the, brought a lot of stress yeah. in the family, but since shifting to, um, and kind of understand sh shifting gears and changing roles a little bit, um, you know, my, my job quote unquote is, you know, making a home that's a home that Rob wants to come home to and that the, that the kids feel safe, you know, thriving in and, um, that's where my heart is. And that's where I think when we were going against that, it, there was other stressors in the family. Yeah, because so, that, you know, to be honest with you, it's that's it's not that I had. I almost enjoyed not. This is coming from my, just speaking for myself and as a man and things like. There was a part of me that was in that took comfort in relinquishing some of that responsibility to be a provider because Debbie made a good income and she brought you know mm -hmm. she was working full time and so I could kind of step back a little bit and you know, do the laundry and the cooking and stuff to make up for that. And there's nothing wrong with that or anything, but to, there was always a part that was, um, you know, when I started to learn more about the authority of, of God, the right, right authority and the way that God structures the, the first family and stuff, I was open to learning about that, that, you know, Christ is the head and the husband, um, you know, is, the, is, you know, it's, it says in Ephesians. So mm -hmm. kind of bringing our, our family structure in line with what we felt God was rather than going against the grain of kind of conforming it to it and making choices to sacrifice in some ways to bring that in line. It's almost like the, the peace and the, um, I don't know, like everything seems to flow more naturally now because it's, uh, it seems to be in right. Everything seems like it's in right order for us, which we're very mm -hmm. grateful for, but I don't know how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of like God's grace just opened doors in certain ways that made it possible. Yeah. So, but, I don't know if that was part of your question. Yeah, but, that, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, we've shifted our family, you know, for that with, mm -hmm. you know, Rob being sort of the provider and um, I'm able to focus being at home and with the children and, mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. If there's anybody on the fence about should I quit to be home with my children, Yes. <laughs> if you're able to do it, <laughs> if you can uh, do it, for us it's been a rough. If lesson. you can do it, it's um I don't look back, and it's um the time spent with my children now they're six and five and eight months, um it's just priceless, and especially when it comes to um, planting seeds of our Catholic faith, you know mm -hmm. that's it isn't something we wanted to do on just on Sundays or mm -hmm. you know right before bedtime, you know you know it's interwoven throughout our day and our in our daily lives, and that's um. You know, and again, going back to the culture, it's very, it's easy to, it's it's counterculture to do something like this, I think. And, um, but I think, I feel like we have to work extra hard to plant those seeds because mm -hmm. our culture is so strong. And um, in terms of uh, like hobbies and things, we, we kind of, we enjoy being together as a family. I think what's important for Debbie and I in our marriage is, one of the things that is seems so important is, um, that I never I took for granted before is just a sense of humor and laughing yeah. and and being able to laugh at yourself and laugh at each other and you know that that is the the oil in a, in the engine for our marriage is just being able to joke around enjoy that this time together white space and yeah we plan a lot of white space for our family not and we don't I don't like to make dates like play dates or anything we're very spontaneous because we kind of like to you know, and we sort of take the lead of our kids, like what kind of day they're having to. <laughs> it's a real blessing to, um, to like the person you're married to. I know it sounds kind of trite, but like, uh, I know that's not, that you know, sometimes you need to, it's not always the case for everybody, but to have, to be able to like the person that you're married to is, 
it's like worth its weight in gold. So it's um, I'm very grateful for that because I like just hanging out with Debbie and, and just if we're reading on the couch or something. So we don't have a ton of hobbies or anything. We don't have a ton <laughs> of free time, but what we do have, we like just spending time together. So, we're not very busy. Awesome. Not very busy. Thank you. I think we definitely have to have another, you know, at some point set up another session for this because we have more questions. But I thought we could maybe use the last five minutes if anybody has uh, prayer intentions, I would want to mention those. And also, um, you know, Rob and Debbie are going to uh, lead us in that uh, a last prayer. And so I'll just open that up. Does anybody have any specific family or health or relational marriage, you know, anything that you want to um, bring to the table for grandkids or kids, you know? Or even any quick comments or questions or anything. We only have a few minutes, but uh, I apologize for blathering on. But. I would like to offer, um, you know, if we could pray that Angelo's, um, it's not his aunt, but his a friend of their family just passed away today. Um, he had uh, dementia and she was in a nursing home. So mm -hmm. pray for her soul. Her first name was Eleanor. And she was in the same uh, nursing home. My father had just passed away back in April. So, and he also had dementia. So, um, you know, we'll just lift up a prayer for Eleanor um, and her, you know, her family. She was in her mid seventies. Yes. Yes. Anyone else? And I also yes from all of our kids. From my mom, Susie Lee. Oh, sorry. Oh no. Is that you, Carl? Yeah, yeah, it's me. For my mom, Susie Lee. She's uh starting the battle of uh, lung cancer that is metastasized into the bone and um we're going to be starting some immunotherapy here on monday and we're just beginning the battle but um the biggest thing for her is the anxiety so we could just pray for peace for her as we enter this battle okay. this is carl correct mm -hmm. yes carl, okay we'll Thank pray you. for her I'll, I'll ask the mercedarians to pray for her too the the religious order Yes. Anybody else? Wonderful. Uh, this is Sarah here. I just have uh -huh. a prayer request for a friend uh, of my daughter's called Emily, uh -huh. who has a very aggressive brain tumor. Okay. And it doesn't seem to be um, helped by chemotherapy. And it actually is, you know, she's losing her eyesight and she they, she's just been married recently and uh, okay. around you know maybe 30 or so so if you'd please keep her in prayer and her husband is antonio we we just hold them very close to our hearts and we'd love for you all to pray for them too. Emily, thank you thank you sarah thank you okay anyone else okay so rob and debbie would you end our uh with a prayer. Sure. In the, of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then Lord, Father Almighty, I belong to you through the intercession of Our Lady of Mercy and our patron Saint Raymond Nonatus. I place myself anew in your hands and acknowledge you as Master and Lord of my life. As Saint Raymond, in imitation of Christ the Redeemer, prayed for his captors, even in the midst of being tortured. Grant me the gift of a forgiving heart and cleanse me of any anger, hostility, or revenge. Heal my hearts and wounds and teach me to rely on your love. Grant me wisdom of heart and strengthen me by your grace to move on in faith, trust, and love through Christ our Lord. Amen. We just want to lift up all these intentions, especially for Susie Lee, for her cancer, for Emily, for a brain tuber, for Andrew's um, relatives, and for Anne as well. And, um, for all those needs and intentions that are in our hearts, we thank you, Lord, and uh, we ask for your intercession um, and uh, your blessed mother and for prayer. Thank you, Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank Good. you, everyone. And please stay. Thank you. We're gonna, I think this is recorded, right, Ann? Yes, I will send everyone, if you want the recording, I'm going to give you my email address again. It's dot S R N F 
at gmail.com. My name on social media is Philly Mercedarian on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. Philly Mercedarian. We will be praying for you and please stay in touch with us. We hope to do another session soon. God bless Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Have a great night. Good night. God bless. God bless. Bye.